Welcome back to the wonderful world of macroeconomics. Today we find ourselves thinking about monetary policy, or rather the precursor to monetary policy, which is understanding how banks can create money in the money supply. The question is, if only about half of the money supply is made up of actual physical currency, and the other half is electronic bank deposits, how are banks involved? The topics for this little lecture are banks and the fractional reserve system, how to calculate the money multiplier, how to use the money multiplier, and why it might be smaller than we think. A quick recap about what banks do. They are the middleman or middlewoman between savers and borrowers. To understand how banks are involved in money supply creation, we need to understand a little bit about their accounting. Here are some terms for you. Banks have assets in the form of loans that are owed to them by customers and reserves on hand, money they have not yet loaned out. On the liability side are the deposits, what they owe you and I when we walk in and want to withdraw our deposits. It's a liability for the bank. This whole account is called a T account. The reserves are what legally banks are required to hold back for safety measures. Banks only earn money on the spread between the interest rate that they earn for their loans, what they charge borrowers, and the interest rate, if any, that they pay their depositors. So banks are incentivized to loan out as much as they can. However, they also need to have money on hand for when depositors come in and withdraw cash or write checks against their accounts. To lend some stability and put faith in the banking system, the Federal Reserve requires that banks hold back about 10% of their deposits and have them on hand as reserves. The reserve ratio is the fraction of the bank deposits that a bank holds as reserves. In this case, $100,000 of reserves divided by deposits of $1 million. That's 10%. So if banks are primarily a bridge between lenders and borrowers, they also act as money creators. They accept deposits and make loans. And in so doing, they create money. Well, how do they do that? Part of the explanation is the fractional reserve banking system, which we've just described. Only a fraction of deposits are held on reserve. This understandably makes some people a little bit nervous. But the reality is, on any given day, most people keep their money parked in a bank. And even if you do spend most of your income and write checks or use your debit card against that income, it ends up in another bank. The reality is, not a very large portion of deposits are actually withdrawn from the banking system as a whole on a given day. A fractional reserve banking system, of course, has its doubters. And the problems really arise when enough people demand their deposits back at the same time. And this happens throughout history in phenomenons called bank runs. The real problem is these bank runs can be contagious. Here's a picture of a bank run during the Great Depression in 1933 in the US. So how do banks actually create money? Well, let's do a thought experiment. Suppose Silas keeps a shoebox full of cash under his bed and then decides to move it into the bank. What's the effect of his $1,000 hitting a bank for the first time. Obviously, they have not had a chance to loan it out yet, so loans are no change. But on the checkable deposit side, they've received $1,000 worth of deposits and $1,000 worth of reserves on the asset side. If it's a for-profit bank here, they're going to want to loan out the, as much as they can of Silas's $1,000 deposit. The Federal Reserve requires that they hold back 10%. So 
So if they loan out the full 90% or $900, we'll find that loans will increase by 900, reserves will drop from 1,000 to 9, uh, pardon me, from 1,000 to 100, a drop of 900. And when you consider that that $900 loan is going to end up in a different bank, let's say to Maya, who pays the money to Anne, who deposits it at her bank, the cycle will begin to be recreated over and over again. The size of the money multiplier, therefore, can be summed up as simply 1 over the required reserve ratio. Assuming that banks want to be fully loaned up, that is, loaning the maximum they're allowed to under law, they'll have zero excess reserves, which would be reserves over and above the required reserves. If we add up all the different increases in money supply through different deposits created by new loans through all the banks after Silas's initial $1,000 deposit, we find that $10,000 is created, or $1,000 over the required reserve ratio. Here are a few questions to test your knowledge. Given the following information, what's the required reserve ratio? And here's the solution. The deposits are $1,000 and the required reserves are 100, so 100 divided by 1,000 is 10%. So here's another question. What happens if the Federal Reserve increases the required reserve ratio from 10% to 20%? Will this A, reduce the size of the money multiplier, B, cause the banking system to contract the level of bank deposits in the system, C, change the value of the money multiplier from 10 to 5, or D, all of the above? Solution is all of the above. And here's the worked problem. And here's the last question. Another thought experiment. You have an evil grandma, hopefully you don't, who steals $40 from you. How much does the money supply change by, assuming a required reserve ratio of 33%? Does it increase or decrease? Does it A, increase by 400, B, decrease by 400, C, increase by 120, or D, decrease by 120? And the answer is decrease by 120. So there's a single equation that we can use for all money multiplier problems. And that is, take your initial change in money supply, multiply it by the money multiplier, one over the required reserve ratio, and you end up with the end change in money supply. Very often policymakers will know the second and the third parts of the equation, but won't know how much initially to inject into the, into the money supply to achieve their goal. As long as we know two of the three, we'll be able to answer the third. Now, why is the actual money multiplier smaller than what we might calculate? The answer is leakages. There's a lot of checkable bank deposits in the money supply, but there's also a lot of cash. As much as people hold cash, that's money that's not sitting in banks, being loaned out, and being useful for the money multiplier. Furthermore, some banks, especially during recessions, may choose not to loan out the full amount that they can. So they're not fully loaned up. They're being extra cautious and holding back deposits. And just a reminder that the money supply can decrease with a money multiplier, just like it can increase with a money multiplier. So what we found out in the Great Depression was that the amount of currency in circulation increased and the number of checkable bank deposits decreased. So the money supply actually decreased because the money multiplier decreased. Thanks for watching.